Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. This is our first public lecture series uh, for 2021. So I guess I should say Happy New Year. Uh, thank you again for joining us. I am really, really excited uh, with the presentation today. I am very thankful for Joanna to join us today. Joanna is uh, a partner at uh, Withers and Rogers. Uh, she's a patent attorney, and uh, I, I have the privilege of working with Joanna. Why I think it is really, really important that uh, we, we start discussing about intellectual property in the creative industry sector is because sometimes people perceive that intellectual property is about a new formulation of uh, rocket fuel well it is but but for uh, but we have to accept that even uh, mickey mouse is somebody's intellectual property so the scope of intellectual property is it goes beyond uh, the the scientific community and and therefore uh, we are so lucky today that joanna agreed to talk with us and to guide us through intellectual property and the holistic way how to look at it for all of us so thank you so much and over to you joanna thank you very much Parag, and happy new year everybody just bear with me a moment while i share my screen Okay, we're up and running. Hello, and thank you, Parik, for the lovely introduction you've just given me. As mentioned, I'm a partner at Withers & Rogers, one of the largest patent and trademark attorney firms in Europe. I'm a patent attorney, so my world is largely patents, but I will also discuss trademarks and some of the other key IP rights today specifically where possible in the context of the fashion and textile industry. But the protection and management of IP is a huge thing in and around the university sector generally. So who am I? How did I come to be here today? Well, I have a lifelong interest in colour and in fabrics, and that's led me to hobbies in knitting, sewing, crochet. Um, I've also always loved reading science and language, which is important for this story. Um, my mother's an artist specializing in 3D textiles, which at a young age included helping me make knitted toys such as the clowns shown above. But coming back to my interest in science, ultimately I chose a safe degree in chemistry and then I did a PhD with the intention of going into research. Yet I found another job as a patent attorney. So what could entice me away from the research bench to do something that at least once upon a time looked a bit like this? Well, a job that allows me to help people, help my clients protect their ideas. So much of my job is about understanding their needs and their business and communicating with them. It means that every day I'm hearing about different aspects of cutting edge developments in my field. And one of my key fields is textiles. I also get to work with language. Writing a patent specification is brilliant fun, um, but it requires a very specific writing style and accurate use of wording. And I get to work with the law. I get to argue with people every single day because a huge part of my job is working with patent examiners who work for the patent offices to agree a monopoly that's commercially useful for my client but fulfills the requirements of patent law. So what types of company do I have the privilege of working with? Well, I've worked with numerous universities and textile companies over the many years that I've been doing this from startups like Bolt Threads, who are a Californian company creating fibers from spider silk proteins to huge multinationals like Unilever and Kawu on their non-wovens portfolio for wipes, nappies and the like. Um, I have a colleague who's become something of an expert in knitting and weaving machines. He works with CJ Antic. 
And whilst I'm not involved in that work, it's close to my heart as I grew up around my mother's knitting machines. In addition, we have a big trademarks team who specialise in luxury brands and they work with some of the very high end fashion labels. The image on this slide on the right is a dress designed by Stella McCartney using bolt thread spider silk yarn. We've discussed that I help my clients protect their ideas. Well, how do I do that? To start explaining, the first question really has to be, what is intellectual property? Well, it's a matrix of property rights that are used together or independently. And we tend to think of them as an arsenal of rights that can be used to protect the products of the mind. So unlike most property, you know, be it a house or a car, IP rights are intangible and they only exist to the extent that they're recorded in the legal document. That makes the document, its form and its content vitally important. So the IP system, how does it work? Well, it's set up to provide a balance between, on the one hand, the interest of the state awarding the right, and on the other hand, the interest of the individual or the company seeking the right. IP does this by offering the IP owner the right to stop other people using their idea. In legal speak, IP rights are monopoly rights. But on the flip side, the overriding quid pro quo of all of this is that you disclose your idea in return for a monopoly on that idea. This disclosure enlarges human knowledge, and that's what the state, the government, gets from the deal. I mentioned that IP is a matrix of legal rights, and we show on this slide some of the key ones. So to start moving around the wheel, at the top we have patents, and we have their, their sister right, utility models. These both protect the way things work. They're your classic invention, right? Um, they both give the owner a monopoly in return for the registration process. And for patents, that's 20 years typically and for utility models somewhere between seven to 10 years. Next up, we have know-how and trade secrets. Now, as you might guess, these protect secrets. Okay. And providing the secret is kept, these offer a non-time limited, you know, potentially infinite protection against the theft of that secret. Now, an example of a trade secret might be the Coca-Cola formulation. That's perhaps the most famous trade secret there is. Um, but it might be a manufacturing process. It might be something behind closed doors that gives you an edge, a commercial edge of any type. Um, key to trade secrets is the need to keep the information secret. Self-evident, really. Um, secret must also have commercial value because it is a secret and the owner must have taken reasonable steps to keep that secret, which requires a level of documentation. Now, moving round to five and six o'clock, we have registered designs and unregistered design rights. Now, both of these protect the way a product looks, unlike patterns which protect the way a product works. And this is all about the aesthetic features of a product. Registered designs, obviously are the registered variant and they can last for up to 25 years. Design right is an unregistered right, it comes into existence automatically when you create the design and it can last in the UK for up to 15 years. Then we have copyright and again a, a sister right, database rights, which becomes more important as the years pass. Um, these are both unregistered rights they're created as soon as the document or the database comes into existence. And they allow for the prevention of copying of literary artistic works or for databases. Key here, and I think key with all unregistered rights, is the need to prove copying. Registered rights are infringed through copying or through completely independent creation. Unregistered rights are not. Now, copyright has one of the longest durations of all of these rights at the life of the author, the life of the creator, plus 70 years. Database right in the UK lasts 15 years from the creation of the database or when it's made available to the public. Lastly, moving round to nine and 10 o'clock positions, we have trademarks. And again, there's a registered and unregistered variant. These protect brands. 
So in other words, the reason you buy by source, why you would choose Kellogg's rather than the supermarket own brand, for instance. Unlike patents and designs, trademarks can exist indefinitely, providing they're being used. Now, all of these rights work together to protect your ideas. And for reasons that I'll explain, it's important to consider these early on, as the IP you want to seek or want to maintain if it's an unregistered form can impact on many of the commercial decisions you make through a product lifetime. Now, I'm aware that the previous slide was pretty dry, pretty theoretical, so how can we add a little bit more meaning to what I'm talking about? Here's three products that hopefully you'll all recognise. Where does the IP lie in each? Well, let's take an iPad. So we would have patents in the software, in the electronics, um, possibly in the polymers, but I happen to know they're not patenting hugely in that area. They have a lot of patents in the area of the glass technology, the screen technology. Um, then you have designs in screen arrangement, the icons, the shape of the tablet, trademarks in, and unfortunately we can't see these in this image, but the name's Apple, the name iPad, um, in the Apple logo, um, and in the names of some of the pieces of software that the iPad is running. Then we have copyright. Well, where does the copyright exist in this? Well, this isn't a purely aesthetic creation, but there is copyright in, again, in the software. Um, and in some of the, the artistic features that have been created. Moving to the middle, bottle of Heinz ketchup. Here we have patents, possibly in the bottle manufacturing method, um, possibly in the formulation. I'm speculating there, I don't know whether or not they exist. We do definitely have trademarks in the name Heinz, as you might expect. And it doesn't show up wonderfully here, but the 57 varieties slogan that they have used for possibly nearly a century now. There are registered designs in the shape of the bottle and in the orientation of the label on the bottle. Trade secrets, well, possibly in the ketchup formulation, but it isn't one of the most famous trade secrets there are. Um, it's far more likely that Heinz have trade secrets in and around some of their manufacturing processes. Um, and then copyright in the label text and in any manufacturing guidelines in the background, any marketing literature that they create. Which brings me on to our, our primary copy exa copyright example. Looking at the Star Wars poster as a representative image of the entire Star Wars empire, which is something very close to my heart, and we'll come back again on this talk. Um, we've got copyright in the poster. Yeah, it's an, primarily an artistic work. Then, of course, you have copyright in elements of the film, in the script, in the film itself, in the cinematography, in the soundtrack. There may be patents in and around the Star Trek universe. Um, Lucasfilm and Skywalker Sound, my word, I nearly forgot that, um, have patents in and around the technology they've developed to enhance the filmmaking process. There are registered designs in a lot of Star Wars merchandise, and there are self-evidently trademarks in the name Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, in a lot of the character names. Um, so hopefully, this gives you a bit of a flavour of how these rights can be used together. What about an example in the textiles area? Well, let's look at Nike. Nike have a lot of patents. For instance, in the textiles used in the clothing, in their sneaker uppers. Surprisingly, in golf ball technology, which is interesting. But Reverting to the sneaker uppers, these are patents that have been litigated. You may or may not remember that nearly 10 years ago in 2012, Nike and Adidas both launched their first knitted running shoes. And that's why we have this image here. 
Each of them had spent a number of years developing its own version of the shoes. However, because Nike developed and patented its technology first, they were first to market and they launched their Flyknit sneakers in February 2012. Adidas didn't bring their Prime Knits to market until July. Not surprisingly, Nike began accusing Adidas of infringing the patent for its, as it referred to it, high-tech one-piece woven uppers, which it considered to be industry-changing products, and I think on the whole they probably were. Now, largely, although appeals were in process, the courts have found in favour of Adidas. Now, they've come to the conclusion that the patents weren't valid. They weren't new and they weren't inventive, and I'll talk about that more in a few slides time. And so there was no valid patent right to infringe, which was a huge blow for Nike, even though they do fight on. In terms of other IP, Nike have filed registered designs to their fabric designs, patterns on t-shirts, etc., to electronic wristbands, garment hangers, believe it or not. Trademarks are obviously a huge part of Nike's business and the value in Nike's business. Um, so you would expect them to have the name Nike trademarked, the swoosh, of course, the Nike word logo, they've registered the Jumpman logo, which obviously comes out of their association with Michael Jordan, and then their slogan, just do it. And these are all incredibly powerful parts of their marketing and their sales. Copyright, well, every time they put a care label in something, that's copyright. And their product designs, production instructions, you know, are subject to copyright, marketing literature. And then we think about know-how, well, again, no clear secret formula in and around Nike, but know-how will exist in so many of their manufacturing processes, for instance, fibre production conditions. So, how can you use IP to work for you? Well, it is very likely that at some point in your life, you'll be creating products for commercial gain. Be that for yourself, be that for your employer, for your employer's clients. And having a basic IP knowledge can help you better serve those people. To recognize that different rights arise in different work products and that each right can be obtained or lost in a different way. And understanding the basics and knowing when to raise questions, and in a sense, that's what this talk's about, is just giving you enough information to know when to ask a question, is something that I can help you with. So, what are the basics? Well, Intellectual property rights are negative rights. They give you the right to stop other people from using your creations for their gain. A piece of intellectual property is a piece of property. It has value, so it needs care. You can buy it, you can sell it, you can license it, you can mortgage it. Um, you can use it for intangible commercial gain, but only if you think about it ahead of time identify it when it's created and take the right steps at the right time. Now you may choose to do nothing. You may decide that yes, you know, we could register this design or we could exert our copyright in this, but we're not going to, we want it to be free for all, or there are other things you want to focus on within your business. But it's important to have enough knowledge to make an informed decision. Moving specifically on to patents, um, what do they protect? Well, they protect how things work, solutions to real world functional or technical problems. That could be a knitting machine, it could be a dyeing process, it could be a new fibre or fabric or the dye used to colour it. What don't they protect? Well. Business methods, um, those simply aren't technical enough. Discoveries, scientific theories, mathematical methods, computer programs. That's 
because it's important that to build a patent, the fundamental scientific theory needs to be free to all. Um, the application of, sorry, did something odd happen there? The application of, um, the application of a new scientific theory, a discovery in technology, in you know, in a commercial way, is patentable. But everybody needs to be allowed to use the scientific theory, the mathematical method themselves, you know, to build upon that knowledge. Aesthetic creations are specifically excluded, they fall within the remit of copyright. And the presentation of information, again, this would be covered by copyright, but it's not sufficiently technical. There's no problem being solved there. And who do patents belong to? Well, the first person they belong to, the default position, is the inventor, the person who comes up with the idea. But very often, the inventor is employed to invent or they have a contractual obligation to assign their rights to their employer, in which case the owner is the employer. And this can often be the case in a university setting. And of course, you can sell this right once it exists. So it may well be owned by an assignee, somebody who's quite simply bought it and has nothing to do with the development or the invention process. So the basic requirements for a patent are that it be new, inventive, industrially applicable, not excluded, and sufficiently described. And I'll talk about each of these in the upcoming slides. So what do we mean by new? Well, to be new, an idea must have not been disclosed anywhere in the world outside of the conditions of confidentiality. A disclosure in an obscure textbook in Patagonia yeah, would be a relevant disclosure if it were found. Perhaps more importantly, because who's going to find that textbook disclosure, is that for something to be new, the disclosure includes your own disclosures, be that in marketing materials, in conference presentations, in posters. So you need to decide if you want protection before you discuss things in public. If you have to disclose sooner, if you have to talk to people, to use confidentiality agreements. The second requirement is that the idea be inventive. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, not obvious to a person of ordinary skill in the relevant art, given knowledge of all prior public disclosure. Not obvious you know, stems from of via in the path. The person of ordinary skill, who's also known as the person skilled in the art, the legal fiction, they're amazing. And you know, they're akin to the man on the clap and bus in regular law. In this case, the skilled person is completely devoid of imagination. They're not even remotely creative, but they're technically skilled and they were, they're aware of all disclosure ever made in the relevant field. Something is inventive if our notional skilled person would not come up with the idea through routine experimentation if it's not lying in their path. Um, in essence, we're looking for an unexpected advantage. Now, how big does this have to be? Let me give you an example. Squash balls, these are squash balls, please believe me, um, had historically been yellow. But with the advent of TV, it became apparent that the viewer couldn't see the squash ball in televised matches. So a change was needed and dark blue squash balls were developed. Was this patentable given the clear need to change the colour? Well, a patent was granted because the choice of colour was important. Dark green, grey, black, tested, didn't work. The innovation was in the selection of a dark blue colour and that was held not to be obvious. And this is the claim the part of a patent which defines the monopoly granted to the patent holder. A squash racket's ball having a matte surface of a blue colour as herein before defined. Why am I telling you this? What's the moral of the story? Well, the innovation doesn't need to be groundbreaking. It can be conceptually very simple. It does need to have commercial value, 
because of the costs and the effort involved in obtaining protection. And that goes for all forms of intellectual property. I'll discuss the other three requirements much more briefly. For something to be industrially applicable, well, if you're filing a patent application, there's generally an industrial problem that you've solved, and so industrial applicability is present. This ground tends only to be a hurdle in the biotechnology field, um, where inventions are skirting close to being purely biological, being purely discoveries in some senses. We've discussed the statutory exclusions above. The key exclusion in practical terms is to computer software. However, computer implemented inventions can be patented, providing they impart something technical to the process they're being programmed for. And lastly, sufficiently described, well, we return to the quid pro quo for the grant of the monopoly right. In return for that monopoly, the applicant must describe at least one way of implementing the invention in enough detail that once the patent expires, the invention can be implemented by a third party thereby enlarging the sum of human knowledge, which is what the patent system was created to do and is seeking to do. So how do we obtain a patent? Well, this is a really highly simplified example of the process. We've mentioned that you need to file before any disclosure. So that's stage one. As with all IP rights and subject to some streamlining agreements, Patent applications must be filed on a country by country basis. You first file in one country, for instance, the UK, then you can file later applications based on this within a year. The general process is that the application is then searched. To give you an idea as to whether the invention is new and inventive, and if things look promising, you move to the examination stage. And this is where I get to argue with the examiners. Um, it's where we've got our case for patentability and we will often at that point amend the scope of the monopoly sort, revise the claims and ultimately, typically, a patent will grant. Now, how long does it take to obtain a granted right? Well, this can be key because until a patent grants, it can't be enforced. You can't sue anybody for infringement or ask them really to take a license under it or so on. In urgent cases, we can take an application to grant in the UK in six months, but it can take up to 10 years in some countries. So for instance, Brazil is particularly slow. And part of a pattern strategy is not just determining where you want protection and what you want protection for, but whether we're seeking a rapid grant, in which case all the costs are condensed into a short period of time, or whether there's no hurry and so costs can be deferred. So, an example, I've mentioned it's the pattern claims that define the monopoly sort. And they're often regarded as the most important part of an application. And whether or not that's true, they're certainly the most heavily scrutinized. So, here we have a claim to a confectionery product, which I'll read for you. A composite confection product, which comprises a multiplicity, for example, at least four, of thin superimposed layers of extrudable aerated confection material comprising ice confection, mousse, whipped cream confection, or an obvious equivalent thereof. The superimposed aerated confection layers being interleaved by very thin layers, i.e. thinner than the aerated confection layers, of fat-based cuvature confection material. Not the clearest thing in the world. In essence, we're talking about a product comprising thin layers of chocolate interleaved between thicker layers of ice cream. What product does this cover? It's our 80s favourite, if you're in my generation you grew up with this, the Vionetta. So, moving on to designs and copyright. Designs of copyright, as we've mentioned, have functions in protecting the way things look, their appearance. Now, designs are for industrial products and copyright is for artistic works. And the key UK case around this difference was what's referred to as the Stormtrooper case. 
the designer of the Stormtrooper costumes based in England in the 70s, Andrew Ainsworth. And he started making and selling replica Stormtrooper outfits. In 2011, Lucasfilm sued for copyright infringement. Now in the US, this was successful. Some of the replicas had been shipped out to the US by being sold to US customers. And damages of $10 million were awarded for copyright and trademark infringement. In the UK, costume designs were held not to be artistic works. And so the case would fall under the remit of unregistered design law. I've already mentioned that unregistered designs last for up to 15 years and the designs were created in 1977. So these rights had expired and Andrew was free to make use of his design to the Stormtrooper. Now Andrew's since expanded his portfolio quite significantly, as you can see from the photographs here of my personal collection. So just very briefly, this is a decanter, it's roughly one litre size made out of an identical mould to this tiny bottle of chilli sauce, which is about 150 ml. Um, a different mould, but I think this is a very interesting product. This is a glass, a drinking glass, where interestingly he's chosen to invert the usual glass shape. This looks amazing with milk in it, but we didn't have any when I took the photograph. It's worth noting that the Star Wars name doesn't appear anywhere on the branding of these products. Instead, he uses the brand Stormtrooper to avoid trademark infringement. Now, we've been talking about unregistered design right. There are weaknesses in all of the unregistered rights. Although a positive is la the lack of fees associated with obtaining them. As mentioned earlier, unregistered design rights and copyright are not monopoly rights. Registered designs are. So for UDR, unregistered design and copyright, copying must be proved. If you just think about the name copyright, it's a right that stops copying. Um, proving this can be difficult, it can be expensive, and it can easily outweigh the legal fees in registering the design. Unregistered design rights also have a shorter duration than registered design rights or copyright, as George Lucas found out. And at up to 15 years in the UK and three in the EU, that's much shorter than 25 years you can get for a registered design. So turning our mind now to registered designs. How are they defined? Well, a design is the outward appearance of a product or part of it, resulting from the lines, contours, colours, shape, texture, materials, or its ornamentation. Now within that definition, we use the word product. What is a product? Well, that's also defined as being any industrial or handicraft item including packaging, graphic symbols, and typographic typefaces, but excluding computer programs. Like patents, registered designs are monopoly rights. They must be new and they must be individual. That's their equivalent of novelty and inventive step in patents. They're territorial, although you can get an EU-wide registered design. Unlike patents, there's no examination as to the design's validity by the UK or the EU Designs Registry. So there is no examination process in the sense of determining novelty and individuality. The registry simply look at whether you filled the form incorrectly and whether you've paid the fees and they will move it to registration, which means it's a very, very quick process. Yeah, within a matter of weeks or months, you can have a registered design which is enforceable once it's registered. An interesting facet of design law is that if you file more than one design at a time, you will get fee reductions. So again, let's try and bring this to life a little bit more. Here's an example of how registered designs are considered in Europe. You will probably be familiar with trunky suitcases and also possibly with their competitor, the kiddie suitcase. So on the left, the Magmatic RCD Register Community Design is the registered design that covered the Trunky product. And on the right, we have the competing Kiddy product. Now, Kiddy made no bones about the fact that they had seen the Trunky product and they had consciously designed around it to try and undercut on price. Yeah. They were aware of the IP and they were trying to avoid it. 
Now, this case reached the UK Supreme Court, the UK's highest court, sitting as an EU designs court. And they decided in particular that the absence of surface decoration can be a feature of a design. And so the lack of features on the body of this representation was a limiting feature. They decided that the fact it was a monochrome image didn't mean anything. It would cover any color that wasn't limiting. And they decided that the applicant's choice to use a CAD image where the wheels, and it isn't terribly well shown here, but the strap were in a contrast color was an important facet of the design. So what did this mean for Trunky? Well, you might be ahead of me and you might realize that the kiddie design was found not to infringe because the lack of surface decoration in the illustrations where clear surface decoration on the side of the kitty product because this design had contrast wheels where and strap whereas the kitty design clearly had a matching strap and had covered or matching wheels depending on exactly how you want to construe that the absence of color wasn't a problem and that's really good news for registered design holders in general as a grayscale image can be used to protect all colors but Trunky lost this case. What does that mean for design holders? Well, to obtain the best protection, it's advisable to file a series of different representations as shown here. Perhaps, if we bear in mind that this was the infringement, if Magmatic had filed a car photograph, perhaps a grayscale photograph to protect against other colours being used, and then a line drawing, the outcome would have been different. And another example of this portfolio use of registered designs is on the next slide. Here are two registered communities of designs for fabrics, filed by Chanel. And it's very common for fabrics designers to register the patterns of their designs, and they can file hundreds in a year. Now, as you can see, they're near identical and part of a series registered in 2017. On the left, there's the design without the Chanel logo, presumably to protect against copies where the infringer is trying to avoid logo use because that would be direct trademark infringement. And the one on the right is again, presumably, the commercial product, including the logo. And this is an example of multiple filings being used to broaden protection clearly showing that rights are being claimed in the underlying fabric with or without the logo. Lastly, in terms of the rights that we'll discuss in detail, we have trademarks. At its most simple level, trademarks are used to distinguish one otherwise identical product from another. So for example, bags of flour. The use of a trademark indicates the commercial origin of the goods to the consumer. Now, as you know, trademarks are widely used in advertising and a trademark owner can secure a com commercial advantage by using their trademarks. They're also used as a guarantee of quality. Uh, through use, trademarks can acquire a reputation and as consumers associate a brand name with certain qualities that a product may have and may therefore be more willing to buy that product. As suggested earlier, the reason why you buy Kellogg's or Heinz as opposed to another brand. It's therefore clear that trademarks can add significant value to a business. What can be registered as a trademark? Well, a trademark is defined as a sign which can distinguish your goods or services from those of others. They must be able to be represented graphically so that it can form part of the legal document. There will often be words, you know, I have Mulberry here as an example, or logos so that other marks have been registered as discussed later. It can often be wise to register both the word itself and the logo form of the word as a picture mark, and this is what Mulberry have done. What else can be registered? Well, along the concept of word marks, you can register letters, IBM, numbers, three, with reference to the mobile provider, images, here we have the Michelin man, and the shape of a Toblerone. And sticking with Toblerone as an example, you can, regi you can register packaging. Um, 
this is the Toblerone box, obviously. Slogans, yeah, I mentioned, yeah, just do it for Nike. Then we've got, I'm loving it, McDonald's, first product technique. There are numerous slogans that have been registered. And although it's challenging to represent these graphically, the smell of newly mown grass has been registered for tennis balls. What else can be registered as a trademark? Well, most often trademarks consist of words and logos, but other non-traditional types of trademarks can be registered, including sounds. I'm hoping you will hear this without too much feedback, but we have the Intel jingle. It's also possible to register moving images, such as this one that's been registered by Castrol. And under certain circumstances, it's also possible to register colours. The slide here includes examples of two of BP's registrations for the colour green, Pantone 348C specifically. Now you'll note that their rights are limited to the colour green as applied to service stations. If you think about it, because there are so many, so few colours available to companies to use, and because Trademark registration effectively removes the ability of other companies to use certain colours. The rights conferred by colour registrations are intentionally limited. It's necessary to provide a Pantone number and a full, quite limiting description. Other famous colour marks include Cadbury Purple and Tiffany Blue. So what's excluded from trademark protection? Well, Descriptive words or elements, so for instance, vibrant for dye products. The reason being that it's unfair to trademark a word that your competitors genuinely need to use to describe their products. Then product names that have become generic, even if they were once registered, lose their monopoly status. So once upon a time, aspirin and escalators were trademarks. Hoover and Porter Cabin invest a huge amount of money in preventing their trademarks from suffering the same fate. Immoral marks, somebody once tried to register tiny penis for children's clothing. And non-distinctive marks, for instance, the Adidas three stripe or many color marks. However, marks that are initially non-distinctive can become so through use as the association grows in the minds of the consumer from repeated exposure to the association between the mark and the product. Interestingly, Adidas Three Stripe is registered in some countries, but variants of this are held to lack distinctiveness in others, despite the mark being used since 1949, and despite the trademark portfolio constituting a third of Adidas's commercial value. Um, these are all legal aspects to take into consideration when choosing a trademark. However, it's also important to take into consideration broader commercial aspects. For example, whether your trademark has a negative connotation in an overseas jurisdiction. And here are some examples of that. Choosing a trademark needs careful consideration. If you intend to sell your product overseas, it's worth checking it doesn't have an unfortunate key. Why register? Well, as with designs, trademark registration gives the owner a monopoly on the use of the trademark with a specified goods and services making it easier for the owner to sue any third party who uses the same or a similar mark for the same or similar goods or services. Relying on unregistered trademark rights under the law of passing off is far more difficult because there are significant costs involved in proving that you have the necessary reputation to bring the action and improving confusion at the point of sale. There's no need to prove any of this with, with a registered trademark right. Further, a registered mark is another asset which can add value to the company. For some companies, it's the most valuable asset they have. Now, when should you register? Well, as there are use requirements for registered trademarks, this should be within five years of starting use. And finally, what should we look to protect? Well, there are all sorts of forms of branding that can be registered with trademarks, as many as possible, so that you have a cluster of rights protecting your brand. What makes a good bark? Red alone probably doesn't bring any particular trademark to mind. What about this shape? Put the two together, perhaps we're getting somewhere. 
Yes, it's Coca-Cola. And that's the power of branding. And here are some examples of the various logos that registered to Coca-Cola, including the shape of the bottle, which was one of the earliest shape, shape marks to be registered. So, I'm aware of time. Let's try and bring this all together in the last few slides. How do these all work? Well, initially, if you're developing a new product, you would be defining a problem that needs to be solved and then figuring out a way to solve it. And that's how the invention arises and how products are developed. At the end of this process, we'll have a prototype. And it's probably a pretty ugly box with wires hanging out of it. And so in the second stage in the middle box, we would work on the design. And this may involve market research to help plan the look of the product and create something desirable. Once you have the aesthetics planned, you might file a design registration. And finally, we need a name for our product. And we generally trademark that. And this stage often goes hand in hand with planning the route to market. You know, if you're selling a product yourself or you're franchising, then the branding becomes very important. You'd want to control that. But if you're licensing the product, perhaps the licensee will want to handle that end of things. And finally, we need to consider enforcement issues. And we discuss an example of multi-right enforcement in the following slides. So, an excellent example of using IP to protect an idea is the Dyson Hoover bagless vacuum cleaner battle. In 1991, Hoover were the market leaders in the UK. They had 25% of the market share. Dyson were a small startup company developing their first product, the DC01. So 10 years later, Dyson had gone from zero market share to 50%, and they'd eroded Hoover's market share from 25 to 10%. One reason for this was that Hoover just couldn't stop Dyson selling their products because Dyson's technology was so revolutionary. I mean, that's a terrible pun um, from what had gone before. And Hoover just didn't have any IP that covered it. Now Dyson has 40% of the market share, numerous products in other fields, and 119 million in operating profits. There's no question that Dyson's success was down to more than the IP, but has been a crucial element of that success, in particular, one case in their journey. So in 1979, Dyson filed their first patent application. It wasn't until 14 years and over 5,000 prototypes later that they launched the DC-01. This shows that providing you have a concept and you have faith in that concept, you can protect future products. You don't even have to have actually finalised them. It also shows that even in relatively simple fields, such as engineering, it can take time to develop a product. And so you have to commit to the intellectual property and often incur significant costs before product launch. So Dyson launched the DC01 in 1993. Five years later, they held 50% of the market share. Not surprisingly, Hoover wanted to claim their part of the market back. Hoover didn't have any patents that they could use against Dyson. So they developed a competing bagless product. And in 1999, 20 years after Dyson filed their first patent application in this space, Hoover launched the triple vortex cleaner. Small problem was it infringed Dyson's patent, which was still in force, was about to expire at the end of the 20 year period. As you can see from the slide, the High Court found Hoover guilty of patent infringement, granted an injunction to prevent further sale, and awarded four million pounds worth of damages. The key point here is that James Dyson recognised that the cyclone technology he was investigating at the end of the 70s was the thing that would make his products competitive. In fact, he created a whole new market. The patent applications he filed helped him keep his competitors out of that market for a number of years. In addition, this incredibly high profile case made it clear that Dyson would enforce their patents, enhancing the deterrent effect raised by the rest of the portfolio. Basically, people would think twice before copying a Dyson product. And patents aren't the whole story. Dyson have made use of registered designs and trademarks too. As the appearance of the DC-01 was at the time revolutionary, it was protected by registered designs to deter knockoff copies. The trademark has been registered to prevent un protect unauthorised use of the Dyson brand, thereby preventing others from piggybacking on the from being established. In addition, Dyson expanded their product range 
They've also expanded their patent portfolio and they have over 5,000 patent applications now. Continuing investment in IP to help keep their competitive edge. And in 2001, Dyson made use of their design registrations to prevent Vax from copying their DCO2 vacuum cleaner, as you can see. So, we're wrapping up now. Where is the value in IP? Hopefully I've shown this during this talk, but in final summary, I thought I'd share some figures with you. Often the intangible assets, largely the IP, are a huge part of the company's value. And in 2020, the Louis Vuitton Hennessy Group had an intangible value of $233 billion, which was 88% of the total company value. For Nike, it was 94% of the company value, $172 billion. This clearly shows that one of the most valuable investments that a company can make is in innovation and reputation. So thank you. I very much appreciate your attention today on a topic that risks being drier than some of the amazing talks that preceded this one. If you have any questions, now is the time. Alternatively, please email the admin address on this slide and your email will be forwarded to me. I understand that this address will reappear in the closing credits, so without further ado, I will close the slideshow and hand over to Pat. Thank you so much, Joanna, for that brilliant presentation. I'll, uh, there are many questions that is coming. I'm conscious about the time, but I'll try to take a few. Uh, I'll start with the easiest one. What do you think about patent blocking? Uh, it uh, asked by uh, one of our PhD students, Ashley. Uh, how frequently patent blocking happens? So I'm going to interpret that as trolling people who have no intention of using a patent, but buying up a portfolio with the intention of preventing other people bringing things onto the market. It does happen, not as often as you think. It's been very high profile in the media. Um, you can buy and sell patents. Um, what they're doing is legal. It might not be a lot of fun, but they are at least showing skill in recognizing the value in the intellectual property and that somebody may want to do it, but it's not being exploited by the inventors. If they buy the patent from somebody and they're happy with the price that they're paid, you know, it's, it's perfectly permissible and legal, even if it may be a little bit unsavory. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I started with a difficult question because it was easier for me to ask. <laughs> so I started with that. Uh, another one from our friend Charlie. Uh, what essentially I think Charlie is asking is obviously uh, you can copyright both product design and process. Uh, now, if you, if you uh, say, say, Pattern the process, then the process changes, a new production facility comes. Can you can you use that new production facility and copyright again? <laughs> or um, can you protect so, the product design? So if we're looking at pattern protection, hopefully your patent attorney will have got you a nice broad scope of protection so that if you modify the process, it will still fall within the scope of the original patent. Um, our entire job is, is chancing our arm in a sense. Somebody comes to us with an invention, yay big, and we stretch it and stretch it and stretch it and see what we can get away with. Because the last thing we want is somebody to very easily be able to design around. In terms of your question, if you make modifications to your process, hopefully they would still be within the patent. In terms of any copyright materials associated with the process, as soon as you develop it, you have the copyright protection. And so in a sense, it's no big deal to regenerate the copyright in and around things. Um, but it depends on how meteoric the change is in the process. If it's incremental, if the fundamental theory is the same, I would like to think that your patent attorney would have drafted you something that is still protected. 
if it's yeah, a step change, then you can imagine it wouldn't fall within the scope and we would need to go back to the beginning and write a new application. But if it's a step change, that should be new and inventive over what you've done before. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I think another question is uh, from our audience member. Uh, say, for example, it relates to development of new textiles. If the raw material has been disclosed in personal communication, but the process remains a secret, could that still be protected under patent or trade secret? Uh, not trade secret, patent. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so if the process is a secret, that can be protected. Absolutely. If the raw material has been disclosed, but the fibers resulting from the processing haven't, there's a scope to protect the fibers. If the fibers themselves have been disclosed, then it would be difficult. Um, some inventions, but it isn't really in applying textiles, um, are regarded as black box. So some electronic inventions, they say, well, you couldn't reverse engineer that. So even if somebody's seen the box, you can still protect. But that doesn't apply so much in the textile arena. So if the, the new fibers have been disclosed, that would kind of be it for the fibers. But you could get the process behind them. You could potentially get intermediates. Applications great. Uh, great. Uh, I'll take another question, but I'll try to share all the questions with you after this. So the very last one is from one of the organizers uh, of this series, uh, Dr. Andrew Hewitt. And the question goes wow. like, are different form forms of IP always distinct or can can there be interconnection and or reference between them? For example, a patent and a copyright design. So they're always distinct. And if you're making use of them, if you're enforcing them, say, you would be enforcing them as a distinct package. But let's put patents aside because they're slightly different from lots of the others. You would often bring an enforcement action where you were relying on a registered design and copyright and possibly also trademark infringement all together. Um, but they would be treated in their own individual ways. And that's why we talk about this as an arsenal, because the Mulberry logo, is one of the, yeah, that has copyright because it started as a drawing that was created on a given date. And then somebody may have started you know, registered a design for that because it's part of the aesthetic appearance of a product. And of course, it's a trademark. So they all work together, even though it's one image. Um, it has all three types of protection. So. Great. Uh, Joanna, on behalf of uh, Department of Fashion and Textiles, University of Huddersfield, I want to really thank you for joining today. And, and it will really inform and we'll use this to, to show our students of what the value of IP in protecting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions, but thank you all for having me. It's been fun. So. Thank you.